to cleverly conceal his internet browser history. What teenage girl didn't wear out the pages with the dirty parts in Judy Bloom's novel Forever? What young boy didn't silently weep into his pillow each night at the thought of dying before he was able to cup a naked breast in his hand? <laughs> and what young reader, boy or girl, couldn't relate to this passage about another character in the Chocolate War, one Roland the Goober Goober? The goober was beautiful when he ran. His long arms and legs moved flowingly and flawlessly, his body floating as if his feet weren't touching the ground. When he ran, he forgot about his acne and his awkwardness and the shyness that paralyzed him when a girl looked his way. Even his thoughts became sharper and things were simple and uncomplicated. Often he rose early in the morning before anyone else and poured himself liquid through the sunrise streets. And everything seemed beautiful, everything in its proper orbit, nothing impossible, the entire world attainable. When I first read that passage back in 1976, I thought, yeah, man, all things are possible. All things, except, and I think you know where I'm going with this, allowing a student like me to study Robert Cormier's novel in my seventh grade classroom. I finished the book and I wrote a positively glowing endorsement. Yes, every kid should read this. And I gave it to my mother to hand into the school board. But even as I wrote my words of praise on behalf of the chocolate war, I swallowed a realistic dose of despair. I knew my words would end up like poor Jerry Renault at the end of the novel, battered, bloodied, bruised, and on the way to the hospital in the back of an ambulance. <laughs> Goliath would win, David would whimper. What a shame. It's a really good book. And that's why I'm honored uh, to stand here today, nearly 40 years later, and speak publicly, finally, on the book's back. <laughs> it's taken me this long. So, to all the Mr. Puckers of the world, I have just one thing to say. Let our children read and decide for themselves. Let them run free through pages where everything seems beautiful, everything is in its proper orbit, nothing is impossible, and the entire world is attainable. Thank you. Please welcome Janet Fox, who will read from the Absolutely True Diary of the Sometime Indian by Sherman Alexander. Well, I chose this book to read a uh, portion of, not only because it's a gorgeous book and one of my favorite books, but because it speaks to so many issues that young people face. Issues of diversity, issues of bullying, issues of being um, not normal or not acceptable in a community. And he does it so beautifully with humor and um, wit and a, a profound sense of self. Um, a warning, <laughs> one of the first lines in this is a little bit raw and offensive. And you know what, it's offensive in ways that are beyond the words on the page. Hey Chief, Roger said, you wanna hear a joke? Sure, I said. Did you know that Indians are living proof that niggers fuck buffalo? I felt like Roger had kicked me in the face. That was the most racist thing I'd ever heard in my life. Roger and his friends were laughing like crazy. I hated them. And I knew what I had to do, so that I had to do something big. I couldn't let them get away with that shit. I wasn't just defending myself. I was defending Indians, black people, and buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> so I punched Roger in the face. He wasn't laughing when he landed on his ass, and he wasn't laughing when his nose bled like red fireworks. I struck some fake karate pose because I figured Roger's gang was going to attack me for bloodying their leader. But they just stared at me. They were shocked. You punched me, Roger said. His voice was thick with blood. I can't believe you punched me. He sounded insulted. He sounded like his poor little feelings had been hurt. I couldn't believe it. He acted like he was the one who'd been wronged. You're an animal, he said. I felt brave all of a sudden. Yeah, maybe it was just a stupid and immature schoolyard fight. Or maybe it was the most important moment of my life. Maybe I was telling the world 
that I was no longer a human target. <coughs> you meet me after school right here, I said. Why? he asked. <laughs> I couldn't believe he was so stupid. <laughs> because we're going to finish this fight. You're crazy, Roger said. He got to his feet and walked away. His gang stared at me like I was a serial killer, and then they followed their leader. I was absolutely confused. I had followed the rules of fighting. I had behaved exactly the way I was supposed to behave. But these white boys had ignored the rules. In fact, they followed a whole other set of mysterious rules where people apparently did not get into this place. Wait, I called after Roger. What do you want? Roger asked. What are the rules? What rules? I didn't know what to say, so I just stood there, red and mute like a stop sign. Roger and his friends disappeared. I felt like somebody had shoved me into a rocket ship and blasted me to a new planet. I was a freaky alien, and there was absolutely no way to get home.
till it looked okay. Then Mickey in dough was just on his way and he made himself an airplane. Then the rake of the bakers ran up with a measuring cup howling milk, milk, milk for the morning cake. What's all the fuss? I'm Mickey the pilot. I get milk the Mickey way. And he grabbed the cup as he flew up and up and up and over the top of the Milky Way in the night kitchen. Mickey the milkman dived down to the bottom singing, I'm in the milk and the milk's in me. God bless milk and God bless me. Then he swam to the top pouring milk from his cup into the batter below. So the bakers, they mixed it and beat it and baked it. Milk in the batter, milk in the batter. We bake cake and nothing's the matter. Now Mickey in the night kitchen cried, cock a doodle doo and slid down the side, straight into bed, cake free and dried. And that's why, thanks to Mickey, we have cake. <laughs> and now, one of our all-time favorites, Mark Miller is going to read from Captain Underpants on day four. <laughs> Sheila Menand asked me if I wanted to uh, participate in this wonderful event. I immediately cried that I wanted to read one of the classics, uh, Huckleberry Finn, or To Kill a Mockingbird, or Captain Underpants. <laughs> <laughs> and I scored really big on <coughs> Captain Underpants. Captain Underpants is the most challenged uh, book in America in 2012, 2013. That according to the American Library Association's Office of Intellectual Freedom, and I suspect it's well on its way to being the most challenged book uh, in 2014. Very interesting book. I read Captain Underpants, I suppose, about 20 years ago. My daughter's a children's librarian, and she makes sure that I get the really good books. <laughs> so, uh, Captain Underpants tells of the adventures of two fourth grade boys, George and Harold. The boys are authors of a comic strip about a superhero they named Captain Underpants. And that's based on the observation that uh, superheroes run around in their underwear. And when uh, George and Harold decided to create one, they patterned it after. So their superhero also runs around in his underwear. Captain Underwear Fright flies around wearing only his briefs and a red cape, saving the world from such monsters as the talking toilet or the inedible monster, a creature who spontaneously comes to life from the school lunch food that the children have thrown away. In addition to their literary endeavors, uh, Harold and George are pranksters. So you, so you get a feel for their animals. Let me read a section from the book. Let's see, where are we? Yes, uh, very good. Remember I said that George and Harold's silly streak got them in big, big trouble once? Well, this is a story of how that happened. And some huge pranks and a little black veil turned their principal into the coolest superhero of all time. That was the day of a big football game between the Hurwitz knuckleheads and the Steubenville stink bugs. The bleachers were filled with fans. The cheerleaders ran onto the field and shook their pom-poms over their heads. Thank you, Leo. <laughs> a fine black dust drifted down around them. Give me a K, shouted the cheerleaders. K, repeated the fans. Give me an N, shouted the cheerleaders. N, repeated the fans. Give me an ah, 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 repeated the fans. <coughs> the cheerleaders sneezed and sneezed some more. 
They couldn't stop sneezing. Hey, shouted the fan with the bleachers. Somebody sprinkled black pepper into the cheerleader's pom pom. I wonder who did that. <laughs> The cheerleaders stumbled off the field, sneezing and dripping with mucus as the marching band took their places. But when the band began to play, steady streams of bubbles began blowing out of their instruments. <laughs> the bubbles were everywhere. Up and down the field, the marching band slipped and slid, leaving behind a thick trail of bubbly foam. Hey, shouted a fan from the bleachers. Somebody poured bubble bath into the marching band's instruments. That, asked another fan. Soon the football team took the field. The knuckleheads kicked the ball. Up, up, up went the ball. Higher and higher it went. The ball sailed into the clouds and kept right on going until nobody could see it anymore. Hey, shouted the fan in the bleachers. Somebody filled the game ball with helium. I wonder who did that, asked another fan. <laughs> The missing ball didn't make any difference because at that moment, the knuckleheads were rolling around the field, scratching and itching like crazy. Hey, shouted the coach, somebody replaced our deep eating muscle rub lotion with Mr. Prankster's extra scratchy itching. <laughs> I wonder who did that, Solid shouted the fans and the bleachers. The whole, went on, whole afternoon went on much the same way with people shouting everything from, hey, somebody put sea monkeys in the lemonade. <laughs> hey, somebody glued all the bathroom doors shut. Before long, most of the fans and the bleachers had gotten up and left. The big game was forfeited, and everybody in the entire school was miserable. Everyone, that is, except for two giggling boys crouched in the shadows beneath the bleachers. Those were the best pranks. Yet, laughed Harold. Yep, chuckled George. They'll be, they'll be hard to top, that's for sure. I just hope we don't get busted for this, said Harold. Don't worry, said George. We covered our tracks pretty well. There's no way we'll get busted. <laughs> and of course they get busted. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty typical incident from the book. Um, and it's interesting that this book is challenged. As the author Dave Gilkey notes, there is no profanity, no sex, no nudity, no drugs, no smoking, no alcohol, no guns, and no more violence than the typical superhero cartoon. Um, on the other hand, it's not hard to see why some people would object to this. There is an ample amount of um, disrespect for authority, pranksterism, uh, kids having fun. <laughs> And there's a ample amount of scatological reference, most of it in the kind of terminology that we parents use to uh, toilet train our children. But it comes out with talking toilets and professor poopy pants and, uh, and references like that, um, which apparently people feel they, object, they need to object to. You know. Why should we encourage people to read this book? Uh, well, it's very fun. <laughs> uh, all of us used to think fart jokes were very funny. <laughs> Some of us still do. <laughs> uh, and there's nothing wrong with a healthy bit of ris disrespect for authority. Um, most important, a book like Captain, Captain Underpants lets children enjoy the, re the joy of reading. Uh, this is a fun book. I suspect particularly those little pranksters who are often the most reluctant readers are the ones that uh, we, have, we can hope will read Captain Underpants, learn to enjoy reading, and get the habit for the rest of their lives. Thank you. Persepolis is an autobiographical memoir 
um, by Marjane Satrapi starts, uh, she starts talking about the um, Islamic Revolution in 1979 and all of the cultural changes that she had to go through. Definitely talks about nonconformists and her family breaking norms. <clears throat> as far as my re research goes, the Chicago Public Schools banned it last year because of the torture scene where one of the guards is urinating on a prisoner. In today's day, where we have people being headed in the same area for the same sorts of reasons, I don't understand why this book can be banned. Because it definitely parallels what's going on today. So I'm just going to read the first couple of pages. <coughs> This is me when I was 10 years old. That was in 1980. And this is a class photo. I'm sitting on the far left, so you don't see me. From left to right, Gomez, Mashid, Narin, Mina. In 1979, a revolution took place. It was later called the Islamic Revolution. Then came 1980, the year it became obligatory to wear the veil at school. We didn't really like to wear the veil, especially since we didn't understand why we had to. It's so hot out. Execution in the name of freedom. Give me back my veil. You'll have to lick my feet. Ooh, I'm the monster of darkness. Giddy up. And also because the year before, in 1979, we were in a French non-religious school where boys and girls were together. And then suddenly, in 1980, all bilingual schools must be closed down. They are symbols of capitalism. Bravo! What wisdom! Of decadence. This is called a cultural revolution. And we found ourselves veiled and separated from our friends. And that was that. Everywhere in the streets, there were demonstrations for and against the veil. At one of the demonstrations, a German journalist took a photo of my mother. I was really proud of her. Her photo was published in all the European newspapers and even in one magazine in the Bahamas. My mother was really scared. Have you seen this? Don't worry, darling. But she dyed her hair and wore dark glasses for a long time. I really didn't know what to think about the veil. Deep down, I was very religious, but as a family, we were very modern and avant-garde. I was born with religion. At the age of six, I was already sure I was the last prophet. This was a few years before the revolution. You see, before me, there had been a few others. I am the last prophet. Boy, I wanted to be a prophet because our maid did not eat with us because my father had a Cadillac, and above all, because my grandmother's knees always ache. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'd like to take a moment and thank all of the wonderful people who made this this evening.
speaker on your um, own computer. Yeah. Hmm. The nice thing is a graphic video, so. <laughs> 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 just just a Yeah, so I under man books and, and Dave Pilkey, so sorry about that. We thought we had the, the whole audio source Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.